Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks and welcome everyone to today's session. We have Nick Diakopoulos uh, today. We're very excited for this session. Uh, Nick is Associate Professor in Communication Studies and Computer Science at Northwestern University, where he also directs the Computational Journalism Lab. He's also the Director of Graduate Studies for the Technology and Social Behavior PhD program. Uh, Nick's research is about computational journalism, and it also includes aspects of automation and algorithms in news production, algorithmic accountability and transparency, social media and news context, as you will learn more about today. Nick also recently authored an award-winning book titled Automating the News, How Algorithms Are Writing the Media, that was published by Harvard University Press. He received his PhD and Master of Science in Computer Science from the School of Interactive Computing at the, and at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And his Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Engineering is from Brown University. Wow, how many achievements. Welcome, Nick. Thank you very much for joining us today. And the floor is yours. Nick, if you're speaking, we can't hear you at the moment. Okay, great. Now I can now I can unmute myself. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself. No worries. Um, no. Thank you so much for the introduction, Agnese. Um, and, and thanks everyone um, uh, uh, for uh, for being here today. Um, so um, yeah, I'm I'm Nick Dikopoulos, um, here to tell you a little bit about um, some of my thinking and research on this topic of news media in the age of AI. Um, you know, a lot of the uh, a lot of the work we do in my lab at Northwestern um, in the computational journalism lab is is on this topic. Um, so I'm really looking forward to uh, to sharing some of that work with you. Um, and and really, uh, thanks again for um, inviting me to be part of this uh, this Maven of the Month series. I'm looking forward to the conversation as well. So let me kind of uh, dive into this a, a little bit. Um, so, uh, so this is the book that Agnesa mentioned, um, you know, some of you may be familiar with this. Um, in the book, I cover a lot of terrain about the future use and challenges of using AI and algorithms in news production. Um, that includes things like data mining, news discovery, um, automated content generation, the use of bots uh, for journalistic purposes, um, the optimization of content for distribution. Uh, and also the role of journalists in investigating algorithmic power in society. Um, and today, uh, I'm going to focus on um, aspects of uh, editorial data mining and automated content production in particular. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about some of our recent work and opportunities um, that I see in these spaces. Um, but of course, there's a lot more to talk about um, uh, than, than we'll be able to cover uh, today. Um, so I think one of the main themes of the book um, uh, across um, all of these areas uh, that I just mentioned um, uh, and which might apply AI in the newsroom is that it's really about the, the people uh, behind the AI because behind that kind of magical AI experience, um, there's the designers, the editors, the reporters, the data journalists, the data scientists, the engineers that are all kind of supporting that complex system to give that appearance of some kind of intelligent um, experience or, or intelligent tool. Um, so, uh, so today I'll try to cut, cut through some of the AI hype and talk a little bit about um, what I see uh, happening with AI in journalism. Uh, and what I see as really the focus of, fo of talking about human-centered AI in journalism. Um, and I'll really kind of emphasize the human and journalistic values um, in technology and how humans and algorithms are increasingly hybridized in news production and how that leads to, I think, different considerations and how we should be thinking about designing and engineering and deploying these tools. So yeah, these are sort of two core ideas um, that I, I see guiding newsroom AI um, uh, when, when I look out in the field. So, the first being kind of human values, and in particular, uh, I would say news values. So, you know, all technologies, um, especially uh, AI technologies, embed and encode uh, human values. These reflect choices like the data that's used to train them, how the data was defined and sampled, how algorithms are parameterized, 
how defaults are chosen, uh, what the system even pays attention to in terms of inputs, uh, whether certain aspects of the world are quantified and other aspects of the world are, are not quantified. Um, these, of course, are all crucial elements. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind that AI systems are tools and they're built by people to serve, uh, to serve people, to serve human means and ends. And that, of course, gives them political valence. So they reflect the values that designers and developers build into them. And so, you know, I see that this kind of suggests an opportunity for journalists and news organizations to also become aware of and exercise their ability to embed their own organizational, institutional, and professional values into the technologies um, uh, of news production. Um, so, you know, when I talk to journalists, I sort of encourage them to think about AI as uh, almost a new medium where they can express and exercise their ethical and normative values through the code that they implement uh, in these systems. Um, the other, uh, I think, core idea that I see guiding newsroom AI is this idea of hybridization. So, you know, every new technology, whether it's uh, telephones, uh, photography, or even copy machines, uh, these have changed um, kind of quite deeply the nature of roles and tasks and workflows in the newsroom. And of course, AI as a technology, as a tool is no different. Uh, it's also going to um, change news work. It's often going to complement news work. But in my research, I haven't often seen it really fully substituting for a uh, trained journalist. So uh, based on some economist estimates, um, maybe 15% of a reporter's job and maybe 9% of an editor's job could be automated using current levels of AI technology. And so um, people really have a, a, a clear edge over the non-Hollywood AI uh, in, in two key areas that are essential to journalism. And those are complex communication and expert thinking. So when you think about reporting, listening, responding, pushing back in an interview, negotiating with sources, and then also having the creativity to put all that together into a compelling story, um, or even knowing when a new angle of attack is needed. Um, AI can't really do um, most of those indis indispensable journalistic tasks, but it can often augment human work to make it more efficient or more high quality uh, in, the, in the output that's generated. So um, again, in my research, more often than not, what I see is AI technology is actually creating new types of work like people need to configure um, tools, they need to parameterize models, they need to um, manually manage knowledge bases, uh, they need to create data, uh, define it and, and annotate it and so on. If we're talking about automated content production, it might include um, uh, template writing and things like that. So I don't really see journalism, I don't really see AI destroying many jobs in journalism. I, I actually see it more as creating more work um, and more tasks, but, um, but not necessarily taking away entire uh, um, jobs. So I'm gonna give you some examples um, uh, of, of these kinds of themes um, in, uh, as we move through the talk here. So first up, I'm gonna talk about um, some work in the area of news discovery. Um, and so this is a big number, 157,000. Um, and this is the number of uh, news stories published by a small sample of 87 media sources in the US over basically one month in November, 2021. Um, and so that's you know, more than 5,000 stories uh, a day, right? Um, certainly there's many more stories than that across all media from the national to the regional to the local as well as niche and trade publications. And of course, um, that's just a small fraction of everything going on in the world that gets written up into a news story. Um, so, you know, one of the questions that this figure prompts is, well, what is it about these 157,000 stories that made them newsworthy and worth writing up um, into, into a news article? And this really gets at the core of news production and the decisions that journalists have to make on a daily basis to decide what they're going to write about and cover. You know, what's newsworthy? What's, what's the story uh, that they, that they uh, wrote up? Is that the most interesting thing they could have written up? Um, you know, given that news isn't a raw material and it has to be manufactured, how do journalists really go out and find 
what's good, what's going on in the world so that they can actually manufacture it into news. So this gets the idea of computational news discovery. Um, of course, there's many different avenues for journalists to learn about and develop ideas for news stories. Um, you know, they maybe they develop their social network, they have connections to the community, and of course, that's those are important mechanisms uh, for finding out about news. But uh, this sort of newer technique, this emerging technique, I'm kind of referring to as computational news discovery, is the use of algorithms to orient editorial attention to potentially newsworthy events or information prior to publication. So the, the premise is really to ask questions like, can we help journalists be more efficient in the news discovery process? Can we help them be more comprehensive in their ability to monitor the world for interesting and important events? Um, or maybe to find stories that they never would have seen without the aid of a computer. So, you know, practically speaking, these uh, CND systems, they send alerts, um, they send leads based on data-driven algorithmic analysis to help orient journalists' attention to events, to documents, to anomalous patterns and data that are more likely to be newsworthy. Um, and, you know, in these screenshots, you know, you can see some of the examples of tools that are out there. We see this being applied in social media monitoring. We see it applied to numeric data streams of uh, public data, for instance. Uh, we see it being applied to local meeting uh, monitoring, uh, transcripts, things like that. And also things like identifying and ranking um, claims for fact checking. So one example of an early um, uh, tool of this kind that we developed is actually this prototype that I designed and, and worked on um, while I was on sabbatical at the Washington Post in the fall of 2019, um, in the before times, before, uh, before the pandemic. Um, and uh, the idea of the tool was really to provide a list of tip sheets on different variables that are being data mined from the U.S. voter file. So the U.S. voter file is a basically a large database which includes voter registration information on mil millions of Americans. Basically, uh, if you voted, you're in this registry. Um, and so it's uh, something like 180 million records, about 650 columns. And the, the idea was really to augment journalists' ability to find interesting demographic patterns in U.S. jurisdictions where then they would go visit to report on. So the idea was the tool could orient journalists to where to go and who to talk to in terms of like a demographic profile uh, when they went to those places. Now, in the tool, you can kind of see in the screenshot, it, you know, you, you get a list of tip sheets, you can search in there for specific um, variables or specific demographic patterns you might be interested in. Uh, and then I'll show you what it looks like when you drill in. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, the newsworthiness that we built into the um, tool. Whoops. So here's what it looks like when you drill into one of the tip sheets. So this is showing um, an example in uh, Pennsylvania um, oriented around white non-college educated um, voter turnout. And the idea is that there's kind of a ranking here of different counties, um, different administrative units, and um, all these bullet points that you see of information are automatically generated from the database. And the ranking is, is, um, is generated based on a synthesis of the newsworthiness criteria that we're using to, to identify the interesting counties. Um, so uh, in terms of the specific news values that we try to reflect, we try to capture some notion of political relevance by looking at the party vote margins and the shift between party votes between 2012, 2016, and 2018. We look at if there's an open seat, if the county has flipped from party to party. Um, and we also integrate some location context like the population rate, the urban, suburban, rural information and so on. And we link out to census information um, uh, and so on. So, um, you know, I think uh, it's important that journalists can kind of um, also get at the original data. So we actually also include a link to the underlying data that they can uh, look at uh, in its raw form. Um, it is kind of a major design effort to put all this stuff together. You know, we, we worked on this for about um, two and a half months at the Post, kind of iterating uh, with many different journalists, political reporters to find what would be the interesting bits of information to include on this kind of tip sheet. Um, and I think it's also important to keep in mind that these are not fully formed story ideas. There is a lot of additional reporting that's needed to, to turn one of these um, 
leads into real journalism. But the premise is very much one of hybridization again, um, where the algorithm is able to sift through hundreds of millions of records to identify interesting patterns, interesting political patterns. And then the expert journalists can apply their own expertise in dialogue with that tool as they decide what's really worth their time and effort to pursue. Um, and you know, it was really gratifying to see that this tool was actually able to help guide some journalists at the post um, to some important locations for their reporting. So in this case, some video journalists were drawn to do a report about Erie County, Pennsylvania, because of the, um, they said it was the low voter registration rate plus the partisan swing from 2012 to 2016 to 2018, which was what caught their eye and led them to want to go to this, um, to this uh, county. Uh, another um, example of a CND tool that I want to talk about is uh, this tool we developed at Northwestern in my lab called Algorithm Tips. The idea here is to support journalists in enabling algorithmic accountability reporting and help journalists discover algorithmic decision making tools in US government. So what's going on with algorithmic decision making in government and to kind of give journalists that first inkling that first idea that there might be something worth uh, investigating there. Uh, you're welcome to, to visit the, the, uh, the site for algorithm tips um, at db.algorithmtips.org. You can see the interface on the right there. Um, you know, you can kind of almost think of it like a Google Alerts that's tuned just for journalists. So, you know, you can kind of set filters and queries. Uh, you can add alerts uh, based on your filters and queries, and it will send you um, an email alert once a week if uh, leads are added to the database um, that match your, your interests. Um, we had various design goals in mind when we built this. You know, we wanted to be sensitive to human effort and attention to enable initial verification and quality assessment and also to uh, enable newsworthiness evaluation again. So uh, you can see in the design, there's various cues to help uh, journalists understand the newsworthiness, including some um, ideas around um, Crowd ratings, so we try to measure controversy, magnitude of impact, negative societal impact, and the surprising or unexpectedness of the, um, of the lead, uh, and try to provide that as a signal um, to, uh, to journalists as well. So um, it is a hybrid process. The way this works is we go out, uh, we actually use a search engine, we go out on the web, we do targeted web scraping, and we monitor government websites, and we collect uh, about 1,000 to 1,500 documents every week um, uh, related to any of about 80 different keyword search terms. And then we um, have a, a um, machine learned model that ranks those documents based on their relevance to this idea of algorithmic decision making. Uh, we enhance the leads with additional information like the jurisdiction, the named entities that are extracting from the documents and so on. Then we have a trained internal expert evaluator who assesses the relevance again, adds topic information, creates a short summary that, um, that goes in the, in the, uh, in the web interface. Um, and, uh, and then we also send it out for those crowd evaluations. The crowd evaluates along different dimensions of newsworthiness. Uh, and then finally, we have an automation step um, that sends out those leads um, uh, to end users who have signed up to receive them once a week. And of course, users um, can apply their um, expert expertise uh, by using the interface tool at the end to browse um, various leads. So we did do an evaluation. I think I probably don't have time to talk through the details now, but uh, just very quickly, it was a longer deployment. We um, had uh, eight journalists, professional journalists, use it for eight weeks. And then we did an interview study with them to understand um, how it was working, whether it was supporting um, their reporting needs and so on. I think it was a uh, very um, optimistic um, uh, uh, feedback. Uh, and I would uh, invite you to check out the full paper um, if you're curious uh, to get those results. I want to briefly touch on this idea of automated text as well. This is another area where we've seen a lot of application of AI in newsrooms. Um, and I just want to talk very briefly about this. So, you know, this is, um, this is an example of an article um, that was uh, produced uh, through automated content generation. 
Um, and uh, I think helps also crystallize this idea of um, hybridization of algorithms and humans. So this is an article that was produced by as part of the RADAR project in the UK. So RADAR is uh, uh, an initiative. Um, uh, it's a, a company um, that works with the Press Association, but they have like um, a handful of data reporters and a few editors, and they produce like thousands of local stories every month across the U.S. Uh, across the UK. Uh, and its stories are run by various local media outlets like the Express and Star uh, that subscribe to a wire service that Radar provides. Now, to produce these stories, which are localized to, to different areas in the UK, they use um, freely available uh, open government data sets that are tabulated by geographic area. And then each reporter on the team develops maybe a couple stories per week into data-driven templates, which include fragments of text and kind of logical if then else rules for how to translate that data into location specific text. So the core structure of the stories might be somewhat similar across um, versions, but the details will be locally tailored. And then the, the data journalists are kind of tasked with figuring out various angles and storylines for the data. They actually also do reporting. They add like kind of broad brush brushstroke background information and national context which gets written into the template as well with that basic story structure. And then the automation is used as kind of a production assistant to adapt some of the text in the templates um, to the local level. So again, you can kind of see automation is being used here as more of a lever for human effort rather than a substitute. Another angle on this that we've been exploring in my lab and experimenting with is um, thinking about more the personalization of, of, of articles. So, um, you know, of course, everyone knows how news feeds like Facebook and Twitter are personalized based on past browsing uh, activity, but there's not actually a ton of work that's considered how to adapt the text itself based on individual factors. So in this example, we're actually personalizing content based on a user's location and their gender information, adapting the relevance of the information presented um, uh, to each individual user based on location. Uh, in this case, it's location in Illinois and for a male gender. Um, and so we're framing some of the information differently because they're male. Um, and we did a pilot study uh, on this. Um, uh, and, um, you know, people, some people appreciate the kind of personalized uh, approach, other people find it a little creepy. We're still exploring um, how to do this, how to convey to end users that the text is personalized, the degree of personalization, the, the types of uh, user information that we personalize toward and so on. So, but I think this uh, is kind of a, a, a promising or at least interesting um, avenue to explore. I think both radar and our own personalized exper uh, experiments um, use this tool called ARIA Studio. You'll, here's just a screenshot of their user interface. And I think it kind of gives you a hint of what hybridization looks like in practice. Um, in, really, in reality, it's really more of a complex interface for word processing. You can almost think of it like a, like a sort of alien word processor that lets the author write fragments of text controlled by these uh, logical rules and, and some programming functions. Um, but what I think is really interesting is that we're seeing in automated writing, you know, most of the advances are coming mostly as a result of what I would see as kind of user interface innovations, figuring out better ways to marry the expertise of journalists together with the capabilities of automation. So I just want to wrap up by um, talking about a few of the ongoing challenges and opportunities that I see in this space. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's kind of four areas that we could kind of touch on briefly here. The idea of technological advances in AI, designing hybridization, developing the human resource to support these hybrid environments, and then also uh, emerging reporting beats that are um, coming about. So I think technological advance is ever present. You know, there's always going to be new opportunities to consider technologically that they might, that, that might impact news production. Um, one that I'm still pretty excited about, um, but which I don't think has been well explored in journalism, are large language models like GPT-3 and so on. Um, of course, we know that these can be used to spew a lot of fake news, but I think that with um, appropriate control, editing, hybridization, oversight, and the appropriate interfaces for journalists, that there could be some interesting uh, useful applications of these models. 
So in my lab, for instance, we're exploring the use of GPT-3 for angle generation in the domain of news discovery. Uh, another challenge and opportunity is how we go about um, designing hybridization uh, in this uh, in, for news production. So, you know, there are, I think, a lot of uh, human computer interaction challenges that are apparent here. So the workflows, the processes that define how information it work is decomposed, how it's delegated to algorithms, how it's recomposed, um, all of these kinds of processes need to be designed and evaluated, um, not only so that they're efficient, but also so that the editors feel confident in the outputs. Um, and, you know, so we really need to kind of understand the roles and the tasks of journalists in these hybrid workflows. We've got to um, study the ways journalists and AI can interact and collaborate uh, and, and so on. And I think it's very important to also remember how to design these hybrid environments so that, um, you know, so that uh, journalists, the, the job that this um, becomes is uh, maintains their autonomy, their agency. And we really kind of think through the ergonomics of labor uh, that these new technologies might upset. So I think there's lots of uh, research waiting to be done there. Uh, in terms of the evolution of the human resource, uh, that's us, right? Um, so, you know, I'm really thinking about, um, you know, how journalists will need to acquire, I think, greater levels of algorithmic media literacy. Uh, this could include things like um, computational thinking, data literacy, uh, advanced methods training, uh, and so on. Um, but I think we'll really need to think about how to up the skills of journalists and editorial workers to be able to make best use of AI uh, in the future. Um, I'm even, you know, kind of toying around with the idea of, you know, what if we had a, a separate um, graduate de degree for computational journalism that's uh, almost like other professional um, PhDs, like uh, in the US, you know, people get a doctorate in law or a doctorate in physical therapy. Um, these are advanced practice um, degrees. We could imagine something like that um, to kind of train the next uh, generation of, of computational journalists. Uh, and then finally, you know, emerging reporting beats. So, you know, advancements in AI and algorithms are not only impacting news production, but of course they're impacting the whole world out there. And that of course leads to new opportunities uh, for journalists to need to investigate, right? So I think there's a lot of kind of growth potential in terms of science and tech, tech journalism. So, you know, as, as AI becomes more sophisticated, journalists are gonna need to uh, also become more sophisticated in how they cover um, uh, AI in society, how they investigate it, uh, and so on. There's also questions about um, bots, you know, just ask Elon Musk, um, questions about the proliferation of, of automation in online environments, um, uh, synthetic media, synthetic media forensics. So there's all these different ways that um, AI is kind of impacting the media kind of uh, from the outside as well. And I think uh, news media will need to respond to that by, uh, by upping its game and, and learning how to um, cover these beats uh, effectively. So I think in closing, I just want to remind everyone that, uh, in my opinion, it really does all come back to the people, their values, uh, how people work together with AI tools. Uh, and in the projects that I presented, I think you'll, you'll also see the importance of designing um, clever ways to bring the strength of people together with the strength of AI to create these new opportunities. And, uh, and, and I do think there are many um, uh, emerging opportunities for story discovery and for content production. Um, so, you know, as we kind of move forward as designers and engineers and so on, I, I think we shouldn't forget that, you know, what really animates AI is the people who design and develop and operate and manage these systems. And so um, I, I do think that um, the future of AI in the newsroom really needs to be very human centered. And again, um, you know, I, I'm pulling on uh, many human computer interaction perspectives in my own work. Um, there's lots to read on, the, on this uh, topic, uh, not only for me, but for many others. Here are a few of the references um, that I've pulled from in, uh, in uh, presenting to you today. Uh, and having said that, I'm happy to, um, to, to take some questions. Thank you all for your attention. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Anisi and Enrico.
<clears throat> okay, th th thank you very much, Nick. This, uh, um, this was uh, extremely exciting, and uh, I think you managed to to squeeze in a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff in 25 minutes. So I, 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 I think you're giving everybody lots of food for thought. So um, just reminding the audience of the rules, if you, um, if you want to ask a question, either uh, raise your hand or put the question uh, directly in the chat. Um, and uh, yeah, Agnes and I will uh, will moderate. So I'll um, I'll just kick off uh, uh, with the first section, uh, with the first question, while uh, people uh, start gathering their thoughts. Um, so one thing that you mentioned, uh, uh, primarily towards the end, was uh, this support for uh, uh, for news angles or new or news values. Um, um, because actually, yeah, just an interesting comment. You you you, um, you have emphasized this kind of non as you call it, non Hollywood elements or news uh, over here in the news. You know, the sort of more like hard graft that journalists need to do, and you know, where I can get support. Of course, there is a lot of uh, more uh, again Hollywood stuff, more kind of creative, uh, and uh, um, I, I would say maybe um, more ambitious stuff that can be done. So starting with the, with the news values, uh, um, you know, a, 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 as you know better, better than, than, than us, you know, uh, journalists, uh, individual journalists, individual news sources have their own set of news values. Uh, you know, of course, the a local newspaper will have news values which have to do primarily with the local community, etc. So to what extent um, that uh, that element can be, you know, how, how do you split that the journalist uh, AI um, split in that particular element of uh, sort of identifying relevant news values uh, in the in the facts and then producing news? Yeah, I mean, this is um, so, yeah, news values is, I think, a crucial element and, and I think a, a fascinating area. Um, for research, I mean, I think it's, um, you know, you saw it in some of the projects I presented. Um, you know, we also have some new work that um, that we're developing that hopefully should be out soon, where we operationalize newsworthiness um, in a computational model using some crowdsource data in the domain of science journalism. So um, there's lots of literature in journalism studies about the, the news values that journalists apply to identify newsworthy information. I think the, the missing gap is in the operationalization of those ideas um, computationally so that we can um, apply them at scale um, and using models. So in some of our work, as I mentioned, we're trying in the domain of science journalism to operationalize some of those ideas, uh, collect data, train models, um, and then apply it for scientific literature monitoring um, from archive, for instance. Uh, and, you know, our, our results are, are encouraging, um, you know, sort of uh, um, reasonable uh, precision at 10 kind of performance that you would imagine would help journalists focus in uh, in, a, in a top ranking on, on the literature that is more interesting. So I'm, I'm kind of somewhat optimistic that we'll be able to operationalize several important news values uh, like this, although I will also say you know, in trying to crowdsource those news values, you need to be very careful because there, there are levels of expertise or there are particular dimensions of news values that are not crowdsourceable. And so we would need to collect data more from expert journalists. There is also a lot of variance. There's a lot of contextual variance in terms of what journalists find newsworthy and when, um, you know, their, their attention is getting pulled in many different directions. Um, and they're paying attention to many different signals in terms of what they ultimately uh, choose to turn into news. There are organizational presser, pressures, there are commercial pressures, um, all of these factors kind of play a role. So even if we can maybe um, have some model that is somewhat predictive, it's not like you're gonna have a model that like is right all the time. So it's it's I think it's gonna be much more of a suggestion for journalists. like. Here's some stuff we, you know, we're able to monitor the web at scale, um, uh, and here's some stuff that might be relevant um, for you, the reporter. But um, but I think journalists are still going to need to be able to be ready to apply their expert judgment, um, so so that they can make the decisions that are most relevant for their audience, for their uh, publication, uh, and so on. And so. I'm really kind of thinking about these computational tools as an ability to expand their um, their their capabilities to monitor more information sources 
Um, and I almost imagine like a future where like there's some version of Google search, which has these news values embedded in it so that journalists can kind of like tweak up or, or tune up certain news values and run a search like which emphasizes like let's say something that's controversial um, or something that uh, you know has a particular form of negative uh, societal impact or yeah so I think that I think there's some opportunities here I guess is where I would leave it I'm optimistic so, so that we will sub subscribe to a Google, uh, you know, Google search with values, you know, <laughs> with the ability of sort of uh, identify content to which is, uh, you know, positive and progressive. Okay, I think we have a few questions. Is, so uh, yeah. I think John was first. Is that correct? Hi, Nick. So uh, that was a fabulous talk. Um, and um, I don't want to ask you any questions, but I'd like your opinion. <laughs> Really, so so I was thinking as you were speaking because it was just a brilliant coverage of everything that is there. So I, I was thinking, what are the biggest challenges that I can think of that journalism has to address in in, in the world today? And and I, I think I came up with three. So I just wanted your opinion on these three challenges as I see them, and if you think AI may help with these in in the next let's say five years to, to give you a long time frame so so the first one for me is is the post-truth world and the fact that on social media platforms um that anyone can say anything which uh, of course the standard media have to compete with and we have uh, that can affect big time things like climate change that's challenge one challenge two you talked about personalization and, and I see, especially in the US, I would call it post-unity, that you're, you're either a Democrat or a Republican, and, and then one doesn't speak to the other, and, and it really affects uh, democracy. In, in the UK, we had a small version of that with Brexit. And, and then the final one is, is the war in, in, in the Ukraine. And, and of course, there's misinformation there, which, which I've sort of covered before. Um, but also, th there's the risk of death. So the serious, you know, there are some journalists who have died, and, and I was wondering, would we ever get anything close to the? There are these um, robot bomb disposal machines that go out, and 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 um, uh, um, in a war zone can um, help to to take out a live bomb. Would we ever have? anything that comes close to a robot journalist or not you know, a semi-robot journalist that would reduce the risk of death for journalists in, in war zones so so i just want your opinions not answer because i've just given yeah. you three big challenges Sorry. yeah those are, those are some great challenges um thanks for thanks for um for for the prompt uh john and i think you know in terms of the um Maybe I'll go in reverse order. So in terms of this idea of a, of a proper robot journalist, I mean, of course there have been prototypes um, um, of robots that can enter an environment and collect information. Um, you know, there's certainly a healthy amount of drone journalism um, going on uh, right now um, around the world um, and used to collect, you know, imagery of, of various kinds, some of it uh, very effectively for investigation, uh, some of it for storytelling purposes. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, some of those drones are semi-autonomously, um, you know, kind of plotted, they fly themselves, um, so on. But ultimately, there is an operator behind the scenes there. I don't necessarily see that changing anytime soon. Um, you know, I'm a, a strong proponent of um, human in the loop kinds of systems. I think, you um, even, even in a Ukraine kind of environment, I, you know, I, I, I think you want uh, an expert editorial thinker steering things at some kind of level. Um, of course, you know, the, the micro um, decisions of how the drone maybe navigates itself from A to B um, are gonna be delegated to the machine. Um, so I, I think we're kind of seeing some of that already, um, but I would be cautious about how far we go towards full automation. Uh, in terms of personalization, you know, I will say, um, you know, I think one of the reasons we haven't seen more personalization at well, article level content is for this reason of uh, the concern over um, uh, polarization, the concern over fear of 
echo chambers, filter bubbles, and so on. Um, and uh, and a, a, an underlying belief in journalism writ large that the public, to the extent that there is a public, uh, should be exposed to um, uh, you know, basically the same story, that everyone should have access to the same information. Um, you know, I think that there are, um, I think, I think that's not a bad thing per se. I think that there, there could be some areas of news coverage, um, in particular, I'm thinking about, um, localization of national stories, the kind of stuff that, uh, that the, the radar project that I show you does where, um, personalization, uh, might not be overly politicized, but might be more about making a story more relevant to you because I know that your hobby is XYZ and I can connect this story frame to your hobby or to something going on in your community or to a, like a trend going on in your community. And by making it more relevant to you, I'm sort of giving you a new opportunity to, to come into, um, to come into that um, topic or that um, issue. Um, I also think that, um, you know, to the degree we want to go down this road, road um, you could imagine personalizing content to try to moderate more extreme positions. So, you know, if I know that you tend to be more towards the left or more towards the right, maybe I can also personalize um, content for you and frame it in a way that kind of pulls you a little bit more toward a, a moderate perspective on an issue. Um, so I personally, I think it's still pretty early days there. I know there's a lot of hesitation around personalization right now. I think um, I think some of that is is well founded, um, but I I would say like let's 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 keep experimenting with it and seeing uh, where the where the issues might be and where the um, possible um, uh, benefits might be. And then in terms of the post truth world, you know this of course is the is the real big one um, in terms of how people get information. Um, you know, I don't know that uh, that AI has a, any big answer to this, right? I mean, this is uh, this is really, um, I think, what we're seeing unleashed as a result of social media, um, and uh, of course, AI has a role to play in uh, in moderating content on platforms. Um, certainly, Facebook, Twitter, and all the other platforms are using AI to identify problematic um, content and flag it uh, for review or sometimes um, automatically um, hide it and so on, or D, D, um, uh, or um, uh, reduce the amplification of it, things like that. So um, is it gonna fix the post-truth world issues? No, but it's, you know, we're, we're all still struggling with how to address that. And I think AI can be one aspect of a response. Uh, but certainly not the only one. Thank you, Nick. Advait also had his hand up. Oh, hi, Nick. Uh, thanks very much for that for that talk. Uh, I used to work uh, on similar topics around 20 years back when I was doing my postdoc at Columbia uh, on the News Blaster project, if uh, anyone still remembers that. Oh, yeah, for and, sure. And it's, it's kind of funny because when uh, when journalists ask me whether we are going to take over their jobs then, uh, I'd sort of say it's the editorial work that's at risk because computers are going to tell you how many column inches your story deserves and, and summarize it by themselves and then decide whether it goes on the front page or not. Uh, and of course, now we consume stuff online and perhaps the column inches uh, 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 are not that relevant. So, they are with the tabloids here. Uh, so, I mean, so the first, the first question is, 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 is that has that happened? Is that, is that happening? Uh, uh, and the second question is, are the examples that you showed me of uh, the data-driven stories, which is where the conversation has gone in the meantime? Uh, uh, so narrative science and uh, 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 and writing reports from school football games and uh, uh, and all the rest of that. But when I look at your stories, it, it strikes me that they're completely textual and non-interactive. And I, uh, uh, so it's a very old-fashioned news story. 
Uh, while if you go to the Guardian, they'd provide you with an infographic so you can click on things and see different things happen. Uh, also put together by journalists. Uh, but I, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on, or, 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 on where this is going to go. Is, is, is it still going to be producing text the way journalists would write, or are there better ways to, to consume data? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good point. So, um, you know, I think uh, when the Associated Press in the US started automating earnings reports back in, I think it was like 2013 when they first started, um, of course, it's all very textual. And, you know, for an earnings report, um, uh, like a short earnings report, that may be adequate. But, you know, there are some other um, initiatives I've seen that have integrated text and an image. Um, uh, there was, uh, there's actually an example I talk about in the book from Der Spiegel, where uh, they generate um, kind of um, uh, match uh, visualizations about um, soccer matches, and uh, and those can be fed into a larger kind of um, process where journalists are kind of interpreting those and uh, including them potentially in their written stories. Um, a few years back, um, trying to remember the name of it, uh, there's another startup that was doing a lot of um, automated uh, uh, data viz generation and integrating that with text. Some of my previous work has also been about automatically generating uh, data visualizations um, to illustrate stories. Um, you know, I, I think it's the technologies out there to do it. I don't know that anyone's like necessarily like selling the complete package right now, um, but uh, but I don't doubt that that they could if there was a if there was a, a user demand or an audience demand for that. Um, in terms of your first question, um, you know I, I guess it's about you know are there instances of um, you know I, I guess journalists being told uh, you know how to do their job essentially, like how many column inches they have to write or, or, um, or, or maybe having their work totally summarized. I mean, there are like bits and pieces here and there. So, but I wouldn't say overall that I'm seeing uh, AI as an editor that's like telling journalists what to do. I see it's like a step lower on the automation kind of spectrum where it's more suggestions uh, for journalists of what to do. And personally, I think that's like the appropriate level of automation. I don't, I don't think we want to get to like an Uberization where there's some centralized algorithm that's like assigning things to journalists or like, okay, you have to go do this, you have to write this. Um, and then the journalist just becomes essentially a, a bot um, that is generating text that the algorithm uses as part of some broader um, uh, production. Uh, I don't think we're really seeing that, uh, um, uh, or at least I haven't seen that that level of automation. You know, it's funny that you you mentioned you worked on News Blaster. I mean, I feel like we're still kind of struggling to get summarization to be like at the level it needs to be at to be publishable automatically uh, without um, human oversight. I know there are some startups that are doing this. I know that, for instance, like. Um, Amazon Alexa, you know, when you ask it um, for like an associated press story, that's being run through a summarizer that's generate, generating that. I don't know to what extent there's humans in the loop in that, and we're still um, kind of uh, assessing those, um, those texts. The last I checked on it was uh, maybe a couple of years ago, and I think they still had a human in the loop, but I, I don't know if that's still the case now. Thank you very, very much. much. Yeah, thanks very much, Anel. Thank we'll you. go back to Ashley's question in a second. I just want to take a few questions from the chat. There's been a lot of discussion in the chat. It's very active. Uh, so the first question, I think you already touched on it when you rep replied to John. Um, and it's more about the personalization aspect and how that affects the filter bubble phenomenon. But I don't know if Q Greenaway wants to unmute and add something more specific about that. Otherwise, uh, we move to the next question from Enrico. Um, how far can we go in making journalists configure and adapt AI by themselves? Any success story so far? 
Yeah. Hey, Nick, um, just, a, just a quick comment for, for me. Uh, yeah. We still have quite a few questions. So please concise answers to concise questions. Thanks. OK, concise, concise answers, yes. Um, <laughs> so uh, how far can we go in making journalists configure and adapt AI by themselves? Um, you know, I think, um, I think in my view of this, we should want journalists to configure and adapt AI um, because they will uh, adapt it in the ways that are aligned with their um, professional norms and ethical commitments and, and so on. Um, I think there is some danger to just pulling stuff off the shelf um, if it's trained on data that is um, from a different context or which may embed biases, which are problematic for, uh, for, for journalism or for representation. So um, the question though is, you know, any success story so far? Um, I mean, I would say AI in the newsroom is still limited to a small elite group of news organizations. You know, there's an initiative in the US led by the a Associated Press where they're trying to train local newsrooms to up their game in terms of AI. But the truth is that um, I think there's a, there's a big gap uh, in terms of expertise. And so the successes that we're seeing so far are uh, at uh, organizations like Bloomberg, the New York Times, um, Reuters, the Washington Post, um, you know, BBC, you know, things, things of that nature. So that was my concise uh, answer, Enrico. Yeah, we're throwing all the big questions at you, so it's a challenge. So thank you very much for uh, being super concise. And um, yeah, uh, Ashley, did you have a question? I do. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I don't do concise. I think most of you know this already. I try. Um, I'm, I'm a lot, well, thank you for the talk. That was really interesting to see what's happening on, on that side of things. I'm a lot more pessimistic than you are. And I actually find this personalization topic particularly alarming. Um, I mean, I think we've seen very, very clearly from what's happened with social media that showing people things that seem relevant to them uh, has some massively catastrophic effects on society. Um, and what I think, I'm broadly taking AI out of it, I mean, uh, broadly what my perception of uh, a major crisis in journalism at the moment is a lack of awareness that journalism isn't just reflecting society is shaping it and that what is considered newsworthy depends on the um, biases of the people who are making those decisions and I'd be quite concerned that um, the sorts of Things like that, so automatic relevance detection or um, reflecting to people, what may seem like mild things that are, are, oh, this is going on in your community, can can amplify and multiply. Um, and also that people tend to take what computers tell them as more trustworthy, like the relationship with the computer itself as a source a, is a bit problematic because people don't necessarily understand data and so on. And yeah. I, I'd be interested to know how you might, in terms of develop, like researching these sorts of systems is, you know, to try and get beyond the um, immediate to are there ways to look at potential longer term social impacts of making these changes to how we do things, because I think Currently, the history of technology journalism is, is dreadful in terms of social impact. So, <laughs> yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for the, the question, um, Ashling. You know, I think it's, it's super important as like the long term, the long term effects, because I think even if you look at like, um, you know, some of the new AI initiatives or AI regulations that are on the table in Europe right now, um, they, they largely frame AI in a way uh, that, you know, in terms of how to regulate it for like um, domains where there's like a, a clear cut, like safety concern, you know, where like something can like hurt you directly. Whereas like the, 
the damage from AI in media is is like a, a, a slower burn. It's like, like, how is it shifting the culture? How is it shaping um, what people talk about, uh, how they talk about it, uh, what people pay attention to, and so on. I don't have a good answer for how to study it longer term. I mean, you know, I, you know, it's maybe, you know, to pick up on something else you you mentioned is this idea of automation bias, the fact that people might just uh, take these suggestions um, uh, and and not think critically about them. I haven't I haven't seen that to be the case in my experience so far. So um, you know, I've uh, interviewed journalists who work with these types of systems, um, like in the fact checking domain, and you know where the automation is like scanning media to identify clean things that politicians are saying that need to be fact checked. And the journalists I've talked to are very aware that there are biases in the tool, that it's not going to show them everything, that they need to have other strategies also for finding fact checkable stuff. And so I think journalists in general, the you know the the serious ones, are very cognizant of this. This also gets at the need for AI literacy and data literacy, so that journalists know the blind spots of these kinds of tools and and know how to compensate for those blind spots. Um, you know, we're also uh, in terms of you know how to study this, have a current collaboration with um, Shipstead. Uh, where we're looking at this question of auto automation bias, actually, in particular, uh, in terms of um, suggestions that um, a model is making to editors and the degree to which those suggestions are just adopted versus uh, versus overruled. And I will also say in, in that data, we're not seeing that journalists just like accept the what the automation is saying. We're seeing that they're actually they are being critical um of what the automation is suggesting and they're overruling it in cases where you might expect them to so again like yeah i mean i think i think uh these are these are you know good important things to be looking at i mean i think as researchers we'll just keep we'll keep at it i think the the key issue is how to study this over over longer time frames and um unfortunately i don't have a great response for that one just as a minor, just a tiny response in terms of studying how people uh, interpret the results. What I would be interested to see is how, if people are being questioning or not of what the AI suggests, relating those to the journalists' own biases and perceptions. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah. That's all. Well, yeah, you. I think that's that's a good point. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank, thank you, Ash. And uh, yeah, I think uh, it's um, well, time is already four o'clock, but um, clearly, uh, <clears throat> this, this clearly, Nico, you have uh, you know, uh, uh, raised a lot of interesting issues and people uh, um, are still asking questions. So I will say, let's take the final two questions. I think, Anna, you had a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, are you happy to unmute yourself and, and ask one of them and then? Uh, uh, Lucas can ask the final one. Anna, are you there? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Nick. So, thanks Hello. a lot. Uh, I think my question was a little bit in line uh, with the one of uh, the longer term that Ashley raised just a second ago. So I think your tools really uh, seem very in fact, impactful and have a big potential of really making journalists um uh being able to develop news in a faster way so uh in a sense i am a bit concerned about the longer term effect of uh, being able to produce uh you know a, a much larger quantity of news um in a era in which a lot of people are asking almost uh, journalism to slow down so what's your opinion on this um on this point, really, is not a question; it's more a, an opinion. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's it. That's an interesting, uh, interesting prompt. Um, I I do think that um, uh, the way in which AI is managed is crucial to think about, right? Because you can use AI to speed everything up, right? But you can also use AI to like increase the quality or the scope or the comprehensiveness of an investigation. 
Um, and, um, you know, I think um, whether or not you choose one or the other depends on the context, but it also depends on what the organizational priorities are, how it's managed, what the editors want to do. So it's like, what are the, what are the forces that the, um, that the owners of the media house are putting on how the AI is being used um, in that organization? A lot of the early successes, I want to say, have been around increasing the quality and the scope of coverage of investigation. Uh, but we do, of course, also see early wins in terms of speed. Um, and you know, I think it's just a matter of um, what is the most important thing for that media organization. Of course, some media houses compete based on speed, like the big um, uh, organizations like Reuters and the Associated Press, they compete on speed. And I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say that um, they shouldn't use AI to compete on speed uh, for sort of narrow kinds of scenarios. Uh, but in general, I'm most optimistic about the increasing the comprehensiveness, the scope, the quality of the reporting using um, AI techniques. Okay, thank you. I uh, will leave it to Lucas. I will not make the other question. Lucas? <laughs> yeah, Lucas, you have the final question. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, I, I was just, uh, I think it's mostly covered from previous questions. Um, but I was just wondering because the examples you've shown, it was, it, it, you kind of have total control of what's going on and how the narrative of your story is going to. Um, uh, be produced, generated by the algorithm of the, uh, from the AI. But uh, the new paradigm, you know, with all these um, GPT-3 and all these large language models that come out, you just prompt something and you, it's really like a black box. You don't really know what is going on there. So there's a really uh, uh, lack of control of how the story will unfold, what stance it will take, what angle it will take. Uh, um, so I was wondering what, how can you embed all these journalistic values and to make sure that what is going to be generated is going to be good? Or, and is this um, human in the loop paradigm that, you know, essentially you're going to have a, a human control and accept or reject some stuff of what is the generation there is going to be? So is that what is the future of a journalist going to be? Just uh, uh, approve or disregard of what uh, an algorithm has produced. That's uh, that's my yeah, question. Yeah, that's that's, uh, that's an interesting um, interesting uh, question. So I'm reminded of a um, uh, I think I think I could call it a classic story written by uh, Roald Dahl um, in the 1950s called The Great Automatic Grammatizator, um, and it's about um, an author who uh, kind of invents this machine, and it, you you'd almost think think of it like stepping into a car, you know, with all these controls and pedals and a, and a steering wheel, and the author is kind of like controlling all this stuff in order to write the output. And um, isn't that what we do with a word uh, editor um, or any other kind of writing tool that we use? You know, as we move from pencils and pencil, you know, pens and pencils up to other kinds of um, uh, computer assisted writing, we keep adding tools that help us be more effective writers. So are journalists just gonna be um, editing, uh, editing with new tools? Yes, I think they're gonna be editing with new tools. I mean, we're all already seeing the results of some of these large language models coming into things like Google Docs. Um, is it necessarily bad that, uh, that I can start writing a sentence and the tool auto completes the sentence um, and then I can review it and evaluate it and make sure that it says exactly what I want it to say? I don't know that that's a bad thing per se. I mean, as long as it's still in the control of the author, as long as they're evaluating it. Um, I mean, I think it's gonna change writing and not just for journalists, but you know, what do I do like 80% of the time in my job? I'm like a writer and an editor. So um, uh, I think it, it has a has potential to change uh, all of our work as, as academics too. But I'm sort of curious about what that future looks like. I'm not, I'm, I'm less afraid of it and more 
let's let's see what happens. I also think people can reject it if they want to. They don't necessarily have to use these tools. So. Okay, that's great. I think uh, we need to close it here. So uh, again, th thank you very much uh, to, to Nick for uh, this extremely stimulating uh, presentation and to everybody in the audience for the excellent questions. And um, so the, the, this has been recorded. Also the video will be put on the KMI website. Uh, so it will be available to posterity uh, forever. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, and thanks uh, so much. Uh, Nick, I'll see you in the post-mortem room then. Okay. Sounds good. See you Thank there. You. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, you. everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.